Hey guys, this is Vince Miller. I am excited you are joining us today. We're in chapter two of our study through the book of James. And I believe the book of James has some excellent content for men, especially in the world that we live in today. Today's topic is building consistency. Now, before we dive in, please do me a favor. Right now, hit that subscribe button below so that you can get notified when new videos come out in this series of studies. And you're going to want to get informed so that you don't miss out. Also, do me another favor. Head over to our website today. That's beresolute.org. Beresolute.org. And do a couple of things for me while you're over there. First, sign up for the Men's Daily Devotional. I write one every single day for men just like you, and they are always short, sweet, and to the point. In fact, right now, I am reading through the book of James with you in the study, so follow along with me daily as I read. Second, while you're over there, you can pick up some all-in gear like you see here, support the mission and the message that I live for here, which is to live all in for him who lived all in for us. So grab a shirt, grab a hat, sport it, share it with some of your friends and others. And if you want to snap a pic and share it with me over on like Facebook or Instagram or even here, wherever you socially gather, I would greatly appreciate that. And with that, fellas, let's dive into chapter two of the book of James. The topic today, building consistency. So when I was a young teen, my grandfather taught me how to golf, and I quickly discovered that consistency was essential to the game. A consistently well-hit shot resulted in consistently well, well, hit balls, right? (laughs) But over time, like most golfers, I have developed some inconsistent swinging patterns that have resulted in consistently poorly hit shots. (laughs) And rather than address all these bad habits, I do what most casual golfers do. I compensate with all these small counter adjustments that make for a pretty ugly swing, right? Like like when playing, I make these uh, small adjustments to like my grip or my club face or my stance, which results in a horrific looking swing, all for a ball that occasionally, mind you, occasionally, lands in the middle of the fairway. (laughs) Don't act like you haven't done this before. But you need to hear this. This is wisdom from golfing legend Jack Nicklaus. He said this, if there is one thing I have learned during my years as a professional, it is that the only thing constant about golf is its inconsistency. Now, fellas, seriously, we have to remember that Jack is overstating the point here, right? But please remember, I did quote, one of the greatest golfers of all time, one of the most consistent golfers of all time, if not the greatest. But the point is this, even great men understand that inconsistency is knocking at the door of men who are not fighting to be consistent, right? And I believe the Christian experience in some ways compares to this. Life is, fellas, inconsistent, but steadfast spiritual consistency in the inconsistencies of life is important for Christian guys like us. So much so that in James chapter two, we have this compelling and interesting case for how to build a more consistent life. Here is what James says as he addresses this all important topic. First, James invests a lot of time on the effects of playing favorites in the church. And his example is actually quite vivid. He explains how we inconsistently treat people, how we sometimes favor a rich man over a poor man. Listen to what he says. He says, For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, You sit here in a good place while you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down at my feet. Have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Now, there's not a person alive who has not played favorites. Let's just be honest. When we play favorites based upon any number of factors, such as like race or beliefs or religion or gender, or in this case, 
our level of income. We do so for the benefits, right? This is because favoritism sometimes has rewards. We support one friend over another because we anticipate reciprocity, or we prefer certain employees over others because they work to advance our agendas, or we maintain certain relationships over others because they have skills and talents and gifts that we need from time to time. One of the most popular expressions of favoritism actually has a name. It's called cronyism, by the way, and we witness a lot of this in business and in government today. Cronyism is the hiring and honoring or awarding of contracts to people that have some financial benefit for us. Therefore, we give time and attention to these relationships because they have potential payout. And in this chapter, James is actually concerned about cronyism in the church and thus the utilization of relationships for personal gain. And, and James is right to be concerned about this because cronyism and favoritism is an infectious disease. It is. It's a disease. Once it gains momentum, it's hard to stop. He even suggests that it can become as abusive and oppressive in the church system as it is in the world system. Listen to this. Are not the rich ones, the ones who oppress you, and the ones who drag you into court, are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you were called? You know, and, and James's point is this. The, the payoff for, for favoritism is, is not what you think it is. The real payoff for favoritism is falsehood and oppression, not financial gain. And James is concerned that falsehood and oppression will find its way into the church's system through cronyism and favoritism. And... James is going to build on this idea by pointing to the consistent problem with this sin, or really any sin. And the consistent problem of sin is this. He establishes that when we treat people inconsistently by playing favorites, we display an inconsistent gospel and yet simultaneously act consistent with the law of sin. I'm gonna say that again because it's super important. <laughs> we display an inconsistent gospel when we play favorites and yet simultaneously act consistent with the law of sin. This is because sin plays no favorites. Just listen to what he says here in James chapter two, verse 10. He says this, for whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of it all. And the point is, we're all guilty of sin. And we have all broken one tiny law. And when we have become guilty of the whole law, because this law excludes no one, no race, no heritage, no ability, and no income level, the poor or the wealthy, sin plays no favorites. And while all this sounds really bad, this is what makes the gospel message so, so good. Regardless of wealth or accomplishment or gifting, there is not a person free from the guilt of sin, which means that there is not a person in need of God's mercy, forgiveness, and love. This is the truth of God's love and the basis of the gospel. And fellas, when we play favorites, we act consistent with the law of sin, but witness inconsistently about the good news of the gospel. You see, the poor man and the rich man have equal sin, but in Christ they also receive equal mercy. To treat them differently communicates an, an inconsistent message, and James is concerned about this. Listen to what he says in verse 12. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. The law of liberty is in direct opposition to any kind of favoritism or inconsistent treatment. In fact, the law of liberty nullifies the whole idea of favoritism. And this is God's righteous judgment. So what do we do to build consistency in our spiritual life? Well, we do this. We eradicate inconsistencies with consistent faith. And I love that James doesn't leave us hanging here. He doesn't leave us hanging at all. He tells us, what to do and actually how to do it. And he keeps it simple. We eradicate all these inconsistencies with a consistent faith. And the rest of the chapter, he spends a great deal of time talking about what faith looks like when it is consistent. 
Consistent faith is infused, infused with action. It is a faith that is evidenced by works, not the inconsistent faith of favoritism. <laughs> and not the inconsistent faith of lip service, but rather, just very simply, a working faith. And our faith must have a connection to good works. The unseen activity of our faith is revealed to the world by action. Otherwise, we become inconsistent men, right? And to accentuate this point, James makes this shocking, I mean, absolutely shocking connection. Here's what he proclaims. He proclaims this. Even the demons believe and shudder. Did you catch that? Even the demons believe and shudder. This is the logical end of belief without works. Belief without works. It's not faith at all. It's this hollow look-alike faith. It appears to be faith, but it isn't. It's belief like that of demons. Now, keep in mind, it is real belief in God, but it's devoid of the action that results in fearful, actually, convulsions at the sight of God. This is by far the most shocking statement in the book of James, and it makes the point. It's an indictment on belief without action. Belief devoid of action is a demonic, look-alike faith. Therefore, we are led to the natural conclusion that our faith must express action to be consistent. But to counter this memorable and, well, very negative example of demons, right? James gives us a positive example, an example that no one would contest. A true example of consistent faith to which all men should aspire. The faith of Father Abraham, who was the man of consistent faith. And no believer would contest Abraham's example. His, his willingness to walk his son up Mount Moriah to be sacrificed is perhaps the greatest story of faith ever told. Abraham, a man born to a pagan family in a pagan land as a pagan person, right? Heard the voice of God and obeyed. He obeyed. Now catch that again. Abraham was a pagan who grew up in a pagan land with a pagan family. And yet, he heard God and obeyed? I mean, listen to what James states next. He says, you see, the faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by his works, and the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. And he was called a friend of God. You see, that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. The overall point is so vivid, we can't miss it. Favoritism is an issue of the heart, right? A heart that's inconsistent with a consistent gospel message. Yet a man's faith, when coupled with action, indicates the gospel he believes. Godly action is the evidence of his unseen faith and becomes the witness that the world sees. And this faith is a witness to a consistent God and his law of liberty. So in conclusion, if you were to ask me how to build consistency in your life based upon what I read here, this is what I tell you to do. Number one, recall the consistent law of sin and our need for the law of liberty. Just recall it. And then number two, respond by being consistent by living out belief in action. Your working faith. And as we do, we become more consistent men in an inconsistent world of cronyism. Right? So do it with me this week. I love you guys. And remember, as always, live all in for him who lived all in for you.